Welcome to ABA Inside Track, the podcast that's like reading in your car, but safer. I'm your host, Robert Perry Cruz, and with me as always are my fabulous co-hosts. Hello, Robert. It's me, Jackie. And it's me, Diana. You said you were done eating. Hi. <laughs> you said it. I did you. You made a promise to our listeners. You said this was fine. That you were done eating. <laughs> Yet here we are. Next step. Barely noticeable. Why do you want to eating? Be why do you want to be eating? Tell me why you want the dinner. Mm mm. No? I'm not doing that. That's just, it's from I the- actually took her I took her dinner and put it out of reach. And then I was waiting for her to ask for That's it. That's usually what I did. Diana used to just grab dinners and eat them while we podcasted. So yeah, we had to start putting them somewhere else so that she had to ask for them and we'd say, Why do you want the dinner? And she'd extrapolate on that sentence. But anyway, this isn't a podcast about how to avoid eating on microphone. This is a podcast about behavior analysis and behavior analytic research, where every week we pick a topic related to the field and we dive into some relevant research articles. And if you couldn't guess by our little bit at the beginning of the episode, this week we are going to be talking about incidental teaching. Are you sure people aren't here for the mouth sounds? (laughs) They love mouth sounds. Was that ASMR? I don't understand what that is, but it's, I don't think it's chewing. I'm pretty sure that's not. No, you give it all sorts of sounds. It's like a nice static. It, it, it I think it varies. I think oh. it's just you make sounds and there's something like pleasing about them or it has some sort of effect on hearing them and, and people just like it. They go they go nuts for it. I actually hate mouth sounds. You like hate you hate what? Mouth sounds. Oh mouth sounds. No, I don't think it's mouth sounds. It's okay. different than mouth sounds. I don't like mouth sounds. Okay, good. So don't go to those mouth sound All YouTube right. channels. I'm here to tell you what articles we're reading for the day. Good. All right. Is it time to do that? Yep. Well, not yet because I didn't get to seg because we were talking about mouth sounds instead. Well, seg away. Well, incidental teaching is a topic that for many of us is one of our <laughs> earliest memories of learning about ABA. Yet here we are 200 plus episodes into doing this show. And we never did it. We've never talked about incidental teaching, except for that one time we read an entire book. It's shocking. About it, which has has come out on the free feed. If you have listened to our discussion of meaningful differences by Hart and Risley, you have heard a little bit about incidental teaching. But as we'll talk at the beginning of the show, incidental teaching and meaningful differences aren't exactly the same thing. You know, the, the million words, the three million word gap is not quite the same as incidental teaching. No. Nor is incidental teaching, as described by Hart and Risley in the 70s, the same as incidental teaching as described by, like, your college professors in the past five or ten years. No. Now's the time of the show, Diana, where we will... Mm -hmm. I put the articles up on a high shelf. You never asked for them, but I prompted you (laughs) enough times. I'm just going to tell you, say, it's time to look at the articles. It's time to look at the articles. But you don't have the articles. I do. I have them right in front of me. Oh, okay. Okay. (laughs) So we have four articles we're going to talk about for today, and they are as follows. Promoting Reciprocal Interactions via Peer Incidental Teaching by McGee, Almeida, Solzer Azaroff, and Feldman, published in the Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis, 1992. I felt like you had more to say after 1992 there. It did sound like that. The next one, I I had scrolled down, I had to scroll back up to find the title, and it is an evaluation of the relative efficacy of and children's preferences for teaching strategies that differ in amount of teacher directedness by Heal, Hanley, and Lair, published in the Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis, 2009. Next, The Effects of Training on Caregiver Implementation of Incidental Teaching by Hisei, Wilder, and Abalon, published in the Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis, 2011. And finally, the OG, Incidental Teaching of Language in the Preschool by Hart and Risley, Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis, 1975. There's something about those old Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis articles from like the late 60s, early 70s. They just feel like they're a different journal in some ways. It just it was the, yeah. the phrasing. I mean, it and, wasn't, but it was exactly. But the, like the phrasing and just the type of research published and the the technology used. It, it feels like a weird historical artifact in some ways. I love it. I love it too. I also love like homemade graphs. Yeah. The graphs that were probably like mm-hmm. hand drawn or like pieced together from things that had been put through a typewriter mm-hmm. and then like mimeographed or something. Oh. 
I love that. I love those too. Do you think current editor Linda LeBlanc would appreciate a, a special article describing the aesthetic changes of Java over the years? <laughs> you should do that. Because maybe cause font we, is different. Maybe nope. maybe a little commentary column. I just love the idea, and I tell this to you know supervisees and, and such. You know, when, when when you read an article in the '90s and they lay out the whole FA process, like it's the first time you've ever heard about this procedure, and now it's you know it's a footnote. Like we did an FA. Yeah, well, there's certainly been, you know, recent publications where they comb through the journals and look to see, like, who's included social validity data and who's included compassionate care wording Mm. and who's included demographic data. So there might be space for your type of analysis if you can, you know, narrow down what it is you... Mm. What is the je ne sais quoi that you're looking for of the old articles? Exactly. Jack, did I ever tell you about the time we cleaned out uh, my mother's basement and garage? And do you know what we found in the basement? Old issues of Jabba. We found almost an entire run of Jabba from 1968 to like the early 70s. Is it from your mom? It was my mom's. Yeah, my mom's old stuff. And we found some Beatles 45s. Like we wow. found I Want to Hold Your Hand in Revolution. It was pretty awesome. Wow. What an amazing day. <laughs> anyway, there's nothing to do with this podcast. I'm just... And that bicycle with the banana seat. Oh, geez, yeah. I'm just, I'm just going down memory lane now. Not incidental teaching lane. So... Incidental teaching doesn't mean that you just incidentally bring up anything. It's, yeah. That's tangential teaching. <laughs> yeah, that's not it. <laughs> it's different than that. So when we talk about incidental teaching, we're talking about really a number of different procedures across time and exactly how and when those definitions are used have shifted over time. To give a little bit of context, well, we're going to start with some definition discussion, but before even that, we're going to do a little bit of a discussion about some of the initial research that Hart and Risley did, because I don't think you can talk about incidental teaching without calling forth Hart and Risley and all of the work that they did uh, across the 70s and into the 80s to develop incidental teaching in its initial form, as well as to develop a lot of what we I think, to, to, you know, we talked about it on our episode, but for the most part to this day, some findings that still hold somewhat true, if not exactly as true as they did back in the original publication of their book, Meaningful Differences. And if you're like, man, Rob, I, I hope you talk about this for two hours. Well, I will not. But if you really want to hear <laughs> us do that, there's a podcast for you that was originally a Patreon exclusive, but is now in the free feed. So it is available for everyone. It's so, in the book club section. In the book the website, club section. If you're looking for it. And Some, free feed just means you can listen for free. Yeah. The C's do cost. Money. If you subscribe, it'll be in the if you just subscribe on Apple Podcasts or whatever, it'll just it'll be there in the list of episodes. So originally Hart and Risley began the work that would become incidental teaching in the sixties during a period of kind of educational and social reform referred to as the war on poverty. It's where the United States looked at what are our policies that we can do to improve the educational disadvantages of poor and low socioeconomic class citizens, specifically children. So what are the advantages that rich people tend to have that we could give or somehow transfer to low income areas and low income neighborhoods? And the big issue Hart and Risley found were that when children would enter school at young ages, even at four, it's a preschool, they already were so far behind their age-matched peers. So just saying, let's get started right when students enter school was, uh, fail state's not quite the right word, but there's no way to make that, you weren't going to be able to catch up. The outcomes were not going to be overall as positive for those children. So something needed to be done earlier. So the thought was, well, what if we look at earlier preschool programs? And you could set up special programs. This is where Montessori, one of the places Montessori came from, looking at direct instruction, the capital D, capital I direct instruction. A lot of these programs were sort of developed around this time. Head Start? Head Start was another one. And while there were definitely some advantages, so again, there are lots of improvements in the academic abilities of many of the students enrolled in these programs. Parents really liked these programs. Uh, A lot of the benefits kind of went away. Most of them were academic, and they sort of faded over time when the services ended. So they were able to see some amount of catch-up in the preschool and kindergarten, and then that sort of catch-up just fell away, almost like nothing had been done previously. So the question became, all right, well, what's still missing? We're doing all this teaching, but it's not resulting in better long-term outcomes. And Hart and Risley worked at a place called Turner House, and it's mentioned in the uh, article, the 75 article we'll be discussing, Mm -hmm. which is a preschool in Kansas City. It's attached to the University of Kansas or supported by the University of Kansas. And they developed an intervention for language to increase spontaneous speech. That was the big thing they were working on. How much are these children talking? 
And one of the ways that they would sort of set up spontaneous speech was they'd have free play blocks and they try to sort of sample blocks. They get a sense of how many words do children have in their dictionaries to try to figure out what is the trajectory of vocabulary growth. And they use this information to say, okay, the vocabulary growth isn't as sharp a curve as we want, so let's do some language intervention. And this is really where all of the strategies around elaborating language that sort of became what we think of as incidental teaching really came from. That idea of let's set up situations of interest to the child and let's make sure that we are giving them language, whether it's a tact, to sort of initially make comments and then let's elaborate on that speech and let's model longer speech utterances. Let's, as we'll talk about in one of the articles, let's add in some questions that the child would then answer. And all of this really meant to just increase the amount of total speech being produced by these children. Right. Because Meaningful Differences, the, the focus of that book is is sort of discovering this differentiation between the groups more so. Right. Exactly. And again, while that research sounds like, and then that was the end of the story, actually, that's only the very beginning of Meaningful Differences in which they then talk about, and all that great language development, it still never really allowed some of the children from the lower socioeconomic groups to catch up. They would learn more language this way, but it never was quite at the pace of matched peers who were coming from higher socioeconomic classes. And then that gets into the rest of the book as to, okay, what does this mean? Why is this? And we're not going to talk about that, though, because it's not really relevant to incidental teaching. Right. But then from there, they went on to say, how can we then increase vocabulary? If it's not happening sort of naturalistically in the home, what Mm -hmm. can additionally be done? Yes. So there's really two parts to a lot of the language. One is the amount of language spoken at home. The other is the use of incidental teaching to increase the length and complexity of utterances. And really what we think about today is, well, Let's combine these things rather than wait for preschool. What if everybody just had some amount of incidental teaching training and we just used techniques like this to increase utterances that technically should decrease those million words gaps and we should see better language development over time and therefore probably better academic and overall kind of social outcomes as children age? Probably. Probably. I feel like we should bring up Dolly Parton here. Because there's also the correlation between just number of books that are present in the household and overall academic achievement. And Dolly Parton has this entire program. I don't know if you know about it, Rob, but where she, if you sign up, then she provides your child with a book that's sent to their house up until age five. I tried. Not in our state? Nope. Oh, man. Did she sign the book? What? I, I think no, I, I temporarily like moved like to another books. state. It's just like no. books. It's just an she increase. Oh, I don't books. care. Here's, here's a fox in a box signed by Dolly Parton. Uh, <laughs> yes, please. No, I did. I signed. I tried to sign up and you can't get in Massachusetts. Okay. Well, that's, I didn't realize that. Yeah. But we are, we have a glut of books in our yeah. house already, but I feel like it's a really nice program. Yeah. And she often provides those types of community services. So yes. Thanks, Dolly. Yeah. So while again, that's correlative. Like, I don't really no know. problem, Diana. <laughs> Diana. I mean, she's working. Diana. Diana. <laughs> Diana she's working nine Diana. to five, so she got to fill those hours. I know. She's busy. She's busy. Well, I can't give you these <laughs> books because you're in mass. Oh, we found a reference for Jackie. Yes. <laughs> All right, Dolly Parton. I want music. you guys to know that my 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 five year old kid can sing "Islands in the Stream" and "The Gambler." Oh my god! All. All Once again, you got us no when to fold yeah. them. And no islands in the stream. That is what we are. So she knows all the words oh, to both those songs. It's between. hilarious. No, careful. We're going to get a copyright yeah, hit sorry. on us. That's true. And I can say that instead of somebody dying in your sleep, we say get a good night's sleep. And nice. she hasn't quite figured it That's out good. yet. It's a positive, <laughs> it's a positive way to, to turn that around. Yeah. It's like when we change the lyrics to Grease. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh. I'm like, it's a honey wagon, guys. <laughs> all right. I don't think that's what they said. It is. It's a honey wagon. It is. Yep, it is. <laughs> So that brings us to the 70s and incidental teaching, as well as then it brings <laughs> us to the present. Let's incidentally, let's incidental teaching. So what we're going to be talking about today are incidental teaching research kind of through the ages. And I, I, I do like kind of how we chose, not to, not to pat ourselves too much on the back, but I do like how we sort of look at a lot of different articles. I think almost every article is from a different decade that we're talking yeah. about. Did it work out? That? I, th- I thought it was either yes. three out of four or all four of them oh, were no. different. Uh, yes, because one's 2009, one's 2011. So no, we, we did we, it. We fudged that a little we're bit. covering but, yeah. four, almost 50, 50 years worth of incidental teaching in one episode. How, we, how can we do this, Let's, folks? Yeah. So let's start by talking about the definition of incidental teaching before we get into the articles and, and our trip through time. Now, if we look at Hart and Risley's original definition of incidental teaching from the 70s, this is a quote. 
Incidental teaching refers to the interaction between an adult and a single child, which arises naturally in an unstructured situation, such as free play, and which is used by the adult to transmit information or give the child practice in developing a skill. Okay, so that's well, that's one of the definitions. Okay. Mm-hmm. When I think of incidental teaching, I'm, I'm mostly thinking I think of that. It's, it's an interaction. It's usually in a one-to-one environment. It typically occurs in – now, for me, usually a more structured environment. And I think unstructured maybe is, is too loosely used because if you never structure your environment, there's a good chance – you don't have an opportunity for incidental teaching in a lot of situations. But again, the free play piece is usually true. And it has some sort of passage of information from the adult or chance for the child to engage in some sort of a, a skill. What that skill is usually is language. I always yeah. like to add child-led. Child-led. Right. So, so to be honest, this is different than how I typically define incidental teaching for my students. This is a broader definition than I usually apply. Mm-hmm. And, you know, maybe that's just the sort of drift or shaping of that definition over time. But Man, it was the 70s, you know. Well, they can call it what they want to because they came up with it. But at this point in time, for me, what you just described, Rob, sounds like natural environment teaching or NET. And incidental teaching, I define as something that often occurs within the natural environment, but is a little bit more specific from that. So... With natural environment teaching, you're doing all the things you just described. It's generally child-led. You're using opportunities to build in teaching practice for some particular type of skill into the naturally occurring play in the environment. So you're utilizing preferred toys and intermixing play opportunities with specific, you know, teaching prompts, right? So maybe... You're playing with the blocks and then you take time out of that to count the blocks or ask them what color are the blocks, right? Or, or you build a bridge and you see if they build a bridge or they build a bridge and you build a bridge, right? And then you look to establish joint attention between the two bridges, right? Any of those types of things that are occurring in the natural environment and for which usually the reinforcement is social in nature. So it's perfect for generalization. You're usually... Training using multiple exemplars, you're training loosely, if we're talking about Stokes and Bear, and you're making the reinforcement something that's going to be maintained in the natural environment and likely using some indiscriminable contingencies as well. So that's a really big area, right? There's so much you can do in NET. And then with incidental teaching specifically, for me, it's a little more like the definition that, well, that my, my article is the McGee one that I'm going to talk about. So like they talked about it in really specific terms, and they even called it a pre-specified chain of child and teacher interaction. So for me, incidental teaching, as I usually define it, is almost always an opportunity to practice manding in the natural environment with the reinforcer that comes at the end being what would naturally be provided for the mand. Mm -hmm. So in this situation, there's a clear motivation that's established in the natural environment Like you guys said before, you've put the articles out of reach of me, right? You wait for the child to initiate interest in that item. You then prompt whatever level of manding you're currently at in order to access the item. So what did I have to say? Let's talk about the articles, right? So Mm. that was like my level of manding. And then once that's been done, then they access the reinforcer that's available in the natural environment. So it's a pretty... Which is the thing. Which is the thing, exactly. So you're not... It's not extra tokens or whatnot right it's like i want goldfish they're in the cabinet you go to the cabinet you see the goldfish you prompt goldfish you get the goldfish right Mm -hmm. it's like very naturally occurring which is why there's overlap between incidental teaching and net Mm -hmm. but for me it's a little bit more of a specific paradigm that's incidental teaching Mm -hmm. and and i agree to some extent diana in terms of incidental teaching uh, that i've usually seen it taught and I've used it in the context of manding. So Mm -hmm. whether it's simple or, you know, more complex mans, even mans in the form of say like questions for information, where is the, Mm -hmm. you know, who has the, you know, those, those types of, those types of interactions. And I know for me, I've always, I've somewhat used incidental teaching and natural environment teaching somewhat interchangeably. And it's one of those phrases of, while I think there are differences in terms of treatment or in terms of engaging in a skill, sometimes I wonder if it's even a valuable differentiation to have. I think we should be doing both of them. Mm -hmm. And I think it's valuable 
in that if you are a student or a clinician of behavior analysis, they are two different things and two different ways that you can be working in the natural setting and be programming and planning for generalization. Because without establishing behavior that's going to be maintained by naturally occurring contingencies, we behavior analysts have not completed our job, right? So the more routes that we have to get toward behavior that's maintained by naturally occurring reinforcers, the better. And I think distinguishing between these two is also important in that incidental teaching is largely going to be language and manding related, whereas NET, there's so many other things you can teach in the natural environment as well. So if you called them both the same thing, but did them both, it wouldn't really matter. But given that we are, you know, scientists, and it's important that we are relating what we do back in a conceptually systematic fashion to the principles of behavior, I think the distinction is worthwhile. Would you say that the say definition more closely encapsulates what you currently define as incidental teaching, what you see kind of the modern interpretation of incidental teaching. And so again, another quote, incidental teaching is a procedure in which stimuli and events are arranged within ongoing typical activities to motivated children to interact with people or practice a skill. The therapist increases the likelihood of child responding by contriving motivating operations in the context of specific interactions. Reinforcers are delivered immediately after each correct response. I would say yes. I like that one. I would if if the reinforcer is not arbitrary. The thing that's yeah. yeah. going to be produced and isn't just generalized social praise. To, to some extent, that one feels a little bit like... It's like a little bit of a bridge between the two. Sort of, yeah. It, it doesn't quite get into some of the same more sort of general phrasing of the Hart and Risley definition, but it also potentially captures the idea that you might be able to do incidental teaching outside of sort of that kind of manned context that we're, we're usually thinking about when running incidental teaching activities. Maybe not. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm off. Again, I think this is a term, these terms... For me, that's the distinction between yeah. the two, and it probably is splitting hairs, right? Like, I don't... I want people to do both of these things, right? Don't take little kids and have them sit at the table and run discrete trials with them. Teach them in this format. Teach them through play. Teach them through childhood opportunities. Establish motivation in the natural environment and always be looking to determine if the reinforcer is actually present and they're teaching the function of the behavior versus the form of the behavior so that it's likely to maintain and be useful to that person in real life. As long as you're doing that, then call it whatever you like. I do think that NET is a larger umbrella term and incidental teaching lives underneath that umbrella. But you can have a conversation like we're having now and, and hear the difference between the two. Mm. To some extent, it feels like Hart and Risley original definition falls more in line with NET. And I sort of wonder where did the distinction come from, like looking through time? I think just more work's been done in this area, mm -hmm. right? And, and this happens all the time that you see drift as far as definitions and what we call different things. We have less of that in our field than a lot of other fields do. So it's natural that this could occur. It's, you know, if you wanted to find it as Hart and Risley, like they did it first. So I guess you still can. So it's not a big deal. But I think the distinction is just worth noting that there are things we do that are fall in NET and things we do that fall in incidental teaching. And the more recent literature that we're going to talk about today defines incidental teaching the way that I just did, mm. for the most part. So young researchers, please. So I'm right, is all I'm saying. Please be aware. Find an old phrase that was used in research that has some sort of social significance now and just rephrase it in a slight different way. And then you'll get cited all the time. <laughs> That's the trick. All right. So now that we have a little bit more clarity as to some of the changes in definition. Super clear. As well as what we're looking for. And I think when we talk about the articles, while we have these sort of broad to more narrow definitions, in many ways, the procedures all looked very much the same. So I think when we're talking about the actual actions of the procedures of these articles, you will, you will have a little bit of a clearer picture of exactly what components we're talking about. So... Let's get into our oldest article, Hart and Risley in 1975. So this is not their original work on incidental teaching, but it is one of their earlier articles describing the incidental teaching process. They're in Turner House. They're working with preschool students. Very exciting. And again, the goal here is not initial incidental teaching. This is sort of more of an expansion of language, which is, again, one of their big goals of how do we expand the utterances of children, as, as you'll notice in the baseline. So 
when we look at their procedures, they are very, this is a great one to read because it sort of just lays out probably what you saw in like your initial in-service training on incidental teaching PowerPoint at your, you know, ABA organization, right? So you have a number of steps that you're going to take. So you set up situations where the child has some sort of need for interaction and it's like, pause. I kind of see it as like the old 70s, those industrial films, like, hmm, what will Susie do? Pause. <laughs> and there's like the big question mark fades in. First, will you even do incidental teaching? Step one, if no, this video is over. If yes, you continue <laughs> on to the next phrase. So you determine, is this a situation in which the child clearly has some sort of want? There's a motivating operation. I'm going to prompt some amount of language. If so... You set a language target. What is the language appropriate for the child? After that, you sort of determine what is the cue that will initiate my instruction. Is it the attention of the child? Is it a attention of the child plus a cue from me? Like, what do you want? What are these? Because the goal is, again, for the child to make spontaneous adult-like language in response to natural cues of the world, not just to respond to adult prompts. And if it's just focused attention, is it just eye contact, you know, physical approach, that kind of questioning look we all have? I love doing that one in trainings where you kind of like, huh, that big, y'all, everyone knows what, I'm look, what I look like when I just made that huh face. Yeah. And we want to make sure that we have some sort of response if the child doesn't respond to our cue. You know, if they don't just spontaneously create the language themselves, what is the cue we're going to use? We'll use some sort of a prompt, maybe from a fullest prompt, like we just have them imitate our language to some sort of a medium prompt where we give partial imitation to a minimal prompt where we just sort of request them to make what they refer to as the terminal language. So we say something like, say it like this. And then and this varies a little bit across some of the articles that we're talking about today. So some of your procedures might vary, but at least in Hart and Risley, they would do two prompts and then here you go, kid. Here's whatever you wanted. You don't have to say anything. I'll repeat it one more time as I give it to you. And then we move along with life. Which I like because you don't want it to be a frustrating experience exactly. and that's going to end up being aversive. Yep. I just want to know one thing is, you know, when I teach folks to to do incidental teaching, I don't have them say, what do you want? I, ag I agree, Diana. I noted that, that Hart and Risley did it, so maybe it's not the worst thing in the world, but I do not like <laughs> what do you want as a cue. I like to keep it out of there as much as possible. Right, and the, the reason... For that, for me, is I don't want to establish that as a BSD. verbal SD yep. that the child may become dependent on. So what you really want is to have a strong EO present and have the adult or whoever is going to get the thing function as the discriminative stimulus. So the child will go to the adult and say, say whatever it is without that intermediary prompt. Mm -hmm. And your mileage may vary, but I found what I'm trying to you love that phrase, explain. I, I know. Uh, when I'm trying to explain SD to someone who's not a behavior analyst, when I use this as an example of, you know, the difference between, hey, I'm hungry and I want a cookie, and what do you want, a cookie? I find so many people, they do, the, oh, those light bulb moments, like, oh, I get it now. I get what that means. Yeah. So, again, try it, try it out. Let me know. Right. Send us an email. So, again, it may not be problematic, but it also potentially could be. Yeah. And again, if you can avoid something that may or may not be problematic, you should just probably avoid it rather than figure it out later. It's an extra step. So in this study, the terminal language that was being looked at really had to do with elaborating mans, pretty much. I love that we have 11 children from low-income families, about five years old, at the Turner House Preschool, are our participants. And Hart and Risley set up these free play periods where they were looking at lots of, you know, they, man, their grad students and their assistants had to write down a lot of stuff. Again, in meaningful differences is all they did. Right, right, right. And the goal really was to... They transcribed, like... Thousands of hours oh, yeah. of footage. From thousands that book. and thousands. Yeah. And the goal was to change children's requests from single sentences to these compound sentences where they included sort of you know answers to why questions. And then how many nouns and verbs were being used. And then did they see uh, novel nouns and verbs being used in the children's utterances? So the baseline here, this is hilarious. The baseline was actually teaching incident teaching using incidental teaching basic requests for play material. So you see. They set up this area where they're, they're called the shelf materials, which I took to mean the crummy materials that are kind of always there. And who cares about these toys? They're boring. Don't play with them. They're Lincoln Logs, guys. Yeah. Yo, <laughs> right. And then Finger toys and Lincoln Logs. And then over the fence, you know, over on the side are all the awesome toys. You know, the really fun preschool I mean, toys. Actually, in 1975, Lincoln Logs may have been the fun. Yeah, Lincoln Logs were the funnest toy. Yeah, yeah. In 1975, it was, I don't know, like a, the newspaper or... 
Slinky. Slinky might have been, yeah. I don't know what other. A ball. That was kind of old old hat by the 70s, right? The ball had been invented years before. A dolly. You can feed her and she wet Some sort herself. of a dolly. <laughs> yep. So we've got our baseline where they're really just looking at teaching labels for the play materials. So all the good stuff is in sight but out of reach. And really the focus here was do these children know the names of all these cool items? If the children asked for the item, they got the item. If they just pointed or said the wrong thing, they would just do kind of what you think of as the the most basic manned training using incidental teaching procedures. So not exactly a baseline in that regard, but it was a beginning point. The goal was to teach the compound sentences. And this is where I think incidental teaching, as Hart and Risley use it, varies from a little bit from what I think the average clinician might think of when they just sort of think of incidental teaching, although not, not, so, not so different. The goal here was to have the child both ask for an item and then add to that sentence by saying what they wanted it for. So for example, they could ask for a truck. That was the baseline. The teaching came into giving them the cue why or what do you want it for and then prompting complete sentences. I want the truck so I can play with it or I want the truck so I can drive it on the mat. Mm-hmm. So giving them additional utterances. And really, anytime they had the child kind of asking for the item or getting assistance about the item, they would provide that, like, why or what for? And then they'd either, you know, use the procedure they talked about. They provide the full verbal model. They provide a partial model. They just sort of give them the cue what for. And after about 44 days of practicing, you had lots and lots of kids. <laughs> I'm sorry, they were, that was a funny They were very that. specific about the amounts about, of time. Yeah. Specifically 44 and one half. That's what days. they said 44 days. I put it in there. Once the flood receded. Yeah. They would start looking at other resources. Reasons. So they'd make the kids talk even more. So what do you really want it? Or what are you going to do with it? So yeah. the kids went from just saying, I want the truck, to I want the truck to play with it, to I want the truck, I'm going to drive it on the floor. You know, just get, just keeping more and more and more yeah. utterances. And I think that that fits in line with, you know, my understanding of incidental teaching. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, we, we glossed over that. We're like, and you pick a target response. Mm-hmm. But that is part of it, is that you, you know, assess where your, where your student is at. And then you pick a response that's a little bit beyond mm-hmm. where they're currently at. I, I always called this request their best. Mm-hmm. So you would get what they could currently do, and then you would provide them with a little bit more. And then once they mastered that, it would always have them give you that much and then provide them a little bit more. So you're basically shaping that response to become more complex. Yeah. Once, and this was the 77th day of school, they let us know, once the children were engaging in these like long, elaborate discussions of why they really needed that truck, it was very important that they have it, <laughs> then they started asking them to use those compound sentences with another child to focus on generalizing the language to other students. So in this, it really was similar in terms of the child clearly indicated they wanted something and from the teacher, and then the teacher cued, I'm going to give it to this kid. You should ask them for it. And then see, did the child spontaneously then engage in the same type of language with that, uh, with that you know, child who's now sort of was holding the item? Otherwise, they would give them you know, minor prompts like, say it like you said it to me, or say it long. Or they'd tell the other child holding the item, like, make sure they ask for it the right way, because all of the children were <laughs> going through this procedure at the same time. So, you know, the goal being to say it right. And then on day 114 of school, they returned to baseline. So they stopped bothering the children with prompts and just saw, what will they say? Okay. So I hope that they wore their 100 day of school wigs. Oh, wigs? You know, when you like dress up like as an old person. Oh, yeah. I don't think they did that then. That's a thing that anyone does ever? Yeah, 100 day of school. You dress up like a 100 year old. Oh, okay. I've never seen that one. Oh. It's kind of weird. Yeah, real weird. (laughs) So as you would expect with basic incidental teaching, we saw, lar- you know, Hart and Risley, I should say, saw large increases in the use of language by children. I was there. We saw them. <laughs> I didn't see it at the time. I've only read about it since then. When they added the extra compound sentences, the children used the compound sentences. When they added the child-directed phrases, they saw an increase in the compound sentences, again, to other children. But then when they removed incidental teaching, which, again, is, is one of those, is this the best way to do a reversal? They saw a continuation of compound sentence use, both toward adults and to children. But again, it's one of those studies where the goal is I want to remove any prompt and still see the magic happen. I would not recommend a reversal. If that, no. If you've taught something and then want to see... It's not really showing you good experimental away, control. That is not, I mean, it's a good thing. It's the results you want, wise, but not the experimental yeah, control exactly. you're looking for. I would for. recommend it maybe something else. But that's okay. 
I'm not going to get into the numbers, but certainly, you know, significant increases in the amount per hour of these sentences. And then as they added the children in to the generalization phase, you saw more compound sentences being directed to the children than had been during baseline. And that sort of continued on. I do want to add, though, the funny anecdote that they did start seeing... Well, this part's not so funny. They saw a lot of novel phrases. They saw new phrases being prompted. They saw new verbs being used that had never been trained or even modeled before. They saw new nouns. They did note that children, when they were talking to adults, their language was probably more polite and a little longer. When it was with children, they'd usually say something like, give me, I want. So Mm. their language is a little more directed. Oh, sorry. No, that was too. Yeah. Yep. And they seem to like incidental teaching. They sort of mentioned this as sort of a a very vague measure of social validity. Where the incidental teaching was occurring, the children seemed to like to play in those areas. But they did not like the generalization task with other children in which many of the children started saying, oh, you know, you've got to ask that friend. The friend would say, ask someone else for it. Or they would sort of tell them to get lost. They didn't want to do it anymore. Or they would ask themselves, I need to say, (laughs) I want this truck because I need to drive it somewhere, you know, and and see if that counted the same way. So again, there's nothing really, you know, nothing super amazing in terms of our modern view of incidental teaching research results in this study, but I do think it is a nice encapsulation of where incidental teaching originally came from, as well as a nice description of sort of what are your choice points when it comes to training incidental teaching, and then an extension of incidental teaching from sort of basic manned repertoires. All right, so with the OGs out of the way, let's move forward into the go-go 90s. (laughs) <laughs> and talk about McGee and colleagues. McGee and me. This article is from 1992. Those are go-go 90s. Uh, yeah, for sure. Okay. Bill Clinton was playing the saxophone on the Arsenio Hall show. Chris Cross is making a jump jump. Yep. Pretty sure. No, that, that, that actually, that song is almost about a month ago was 30 years old. Wow. Bill Clinton playing the saxophone on Arsenio Hall is almost exactly 30 years old this week of this recording. Okay, great. Fun facts. Thanks, Rob. That's all we got here. Thank you. All right. So this article was building upon the incidental teaching literature and said, you know, this is an important skill to teach, but there's always questions remaining regarding generalization of this skill outside of the teaching setting. And given that all, you know, I just gave you guys that whole spiel about how important generalization is, we should probably check on that. Maybe we could increase generalization by having this skill be taught via peers. So that's what they wanted to do in this study, teach the peers how to conduct incidental teaching and then measure as they made the teaching scenario looser and looser if the behavior generalized and then maintained over those different settings. So that's what they wanted to do. It was a multiple baseline across participants and they had three children who were what they called the target child. These were all boys who carried a diagnosis And they were named Ian, Max, and Sam, and ranged in age from three and a half to almost six. And then they were also the peers. These were three girls who were between three and a half and and almost five. And I put in my notes that they were from, I put bossy, three bossy little girls. Who are the bossiest kids in your room? They probably were bossy little girls. Probably loved doing this. Yeah. I got the feeling they loved doing this study. Sounds like my kid. Yes. She would love this study. She would be great in this study. She's so bossy. So the... The boys were chosen because they were there and receiving services, and then the girls. Like were in chosen. most situations, the boys were just there. Yeah, they they honestly they they were like we just picked them because they were available, which is weird to write. The we girls, boys are always available. The girls were chosen because they were the oldest in the class. They were generally very compliant with the teacher instructions, and they said that they had high status amongst the preschoolers. Oh, the cool kids! They were the cool kids. I wow. know they were the bossy cool kids. Right? So this is the mean girl. Group. <laughs> they were wearing their clothes backwards like crisscross at the time. No, I think on, you know, Wednesdays we wear pink or whatever it might mm. be. It's probably what's going on here. And then they had two other kids that were included for like this other comparison thing and they were younger. But that doesn't really matter. The setting was a socially integrated preschool classroom. They took the data during free play. This was a very unstructured time in which everyone was playing dress up and playing with blocks and trucks and things like that. The teacher was going around and checking on everyone the toys that they were going to use for incidental teaching were in plastic buckets, so they were kind of you know a little more manageable as far as access goes. And then the peer tutors also had these little mini clipboards 
available to them. And don't forget about those because those will come back up later. The independent variable was the peer training to do the incidental teaching. And then the dependent variable, they made it like super complicated and then just distilled it down again. So they took five minute samples of videotape behavior broken down into 10 second interval bins. And for each of those bins, they coded the behavior as either motor gestural or vocal verbal and also positive or negative. And then they took that information and like rolled it up into this other official dependent variable, which was called reciprocal interactions. So reciprocal interactions was defined as, quote, a positive child interaction to or from the target child, which was the child ASD, and followed by a positive response from or to the target child in the next interval. So basically, two kids had to talk to each other. And it, they both had to be saying something positive <laughs> was what a reciprocal interaction was. And they didn't care which direction it went. If it was initiated by the peer and the target child responded, that was fine. They did break it down, but overall it was just, did they have a back and forth? So they did baseline where they just checked to see, did anybody do this? And that's all. And then they did peer training and it was, you know, very simple training. They just taught the kids how to do this and we didn't get any details on how Really, but they taught them to do four things. One, wait for the target child to initiate a request for the toy that was in the bucket. And the request was just like some type of indicator, like they tried to reach for it. Then two, ask the child to label the toy. So they taught the peer to say like, oh, you want the duck? Say duck. Once they said duck, give the toy. And then praise the correct answer. Great, you said duck. Here it is. And that was it. They also taught them to take turns, right, with the toys. So they were playing with the toys together. So the, you know, the target child got the duck. They played with the duck for a minute. And then the peer, they taught the peer to ask for a turn with the toy because that kind of reset the opportunity for them to then initiate another manned interaction. That's what that looked like. And then they spent a little while in this article telling us about what type of reinforcement the peers received. So these were the little girls, right? And I think that they thought they were going to need to have all this reinforcement built in, but they really didn't, honestly. Like, if you've worked with kids in this capacity, you don't, you didn't need to give them anything. But they had them take a teacher break mm. in the break room. Oh, I, I bet know. they love that. I know. It's a really adorable article. So, like, within the hour, they got to go take a five minute break. And initially, they would sit and chat with the experimenter, but then when all the little girls were involved, they went and took a break together. Aww. I know, right? In that, like, adorable. So they established the training first. They only did eight sessions, Rob, not 44. Mm -hmm. And then after the... 44 days. Okay. How many sessions? We don't know. After those initial eight sessions, the peers rotated. So they all did this, their training with each of the other target children. And that was intended to promote generalization. So they did the training phase. And they did a fading phase where initially the experimenter had been there to help with this process. They were faded back they also encouraged the peer and the target child to interact without just doing the incidental teaching, right? Because I think initially it probably looked pretty artificial. So they were like, oh, yeah, do that sometimes, but also just play together. And I, I like that they did this, mm -hmm. right? So that was a piece of it. But they, this is where the clipboards come back in. They said, however, they tried to fade out the clipboards, but all the kids loved these clipboards Aww. so much. They said the clipboards were a high status item. So they had to keep them in the classroom and they just made them available non contingently to all of the children in the classroom. I could see that though. I can completely see this happening. Yeah. Because clipboards are cool. Clipboards are cool, and I guess these are like mini, they're like child size. Oh, like little, like maybe like the plastic ones mm -hmm. with a little, mm -hmm. you know, they don't have the, the snapper on top. Yeah, so I can totally like picture all of these kids being like, I wanted a clipboard, I wanted a clipboard. They're like, fine, everyone can have a clipboard. <laughs> so rather than get, getting rid of the clipboards and the fading, they actually just had to add more clipboards. That's amazing. And then in limitations, your district may not have the money for all of know, these clipboards. Right? <laughs> They're Lisa Frank clipboard. <laughs> and then in the fading two, level two, the experimenter went out of the room entirely. And then they tried to do this social validity stuff, which I thought was kind of weird and not well described, where the teachers rated the kids on a bunch of things, and they don't give us the details about that. And then they had the peers rate 
themselves or each other and the target children on how much they wanted to play with them, which is seemed kind of mean because the scores were you know differentiated. Mm. Yeah. Although all of the scores improved over time, but I don't want to talk about it. It was the nineties. Yeah. But things still. would be different what? now. What does that have to do with well, the I mean, 90s? We might do it differently we now. We might do it differently And they didn't now. ask the target kids at all. <laughs> yeah. Yes. They will. Because initially I was like, oh, that's so great. They checked to see like if they liked if they liked being taught by this peer. Yep. No, that was never discussed. So Okay, that feels like the 90s, that right. component. I was just going to say asking people, you know, what kind of person do you want to be a friend? That that's I think that is that is a valid a valid measure in terms of or at least a socially valid measure in terms of friendship being a two-way street. But they didn't check it two ways. No, they so, didn't. That's the big right. that, so, that I, I mean, was from. That's why I just we might do it differently now. So as far as the data we didn't go, know, we were watching Bill Clinton play saxophone in the Arsenio Hall show. We didn't have great social validity measures. I think I was watching Paul Abdul and that cat, MC their, Scat Cat, do their music video together. Opposites attract. Yeah, exactly. Which which we found in this in this study, perhaps I don't know. The kids like different things, and then they like the same thing at the end. No, it's just a matter of fact. Mm. As far as the data go, in baseline, the scores were low. Following training, and remember they were looking at this reciprocal interaction thing, specifically for the target children, the little boys, they found that they increased after the peers were trained. That's great. Yeah. They were a little bit variable. Ian and Max had fairly high levels of responding, although it was quite variable for them. Sam was less variable, but also lower overall. And then they went through and did a pretty long fading procedure, honestly. And this is where they were checking for generalization as well as sort of maintenance of those skills across those settings. And again, it was variable, but the scores remained pretty much within the range of training that they were at the training. And that's all I'm going to say about that. So you can not only teach adults to do instant teaching, you can teach peers to do instant teaching. Although I wish we had a little more information on how it was well received by everybody. Mm. The little boys could have been like, those girls are a little bossy. I know. Mm. Probably right? <laughs> that is what they thought. Why did they have access to the bucket? Why did they have a clipboard? Mm-hmm. Well, before we get into our trip into the <laughs> 2000s, I'm seeing from the cues, everyone's giving me the wrap it up signal. So why don't we take a little break and then we'll come right back. Do you want to be a BCBA? Sure, we all do. Now you can come to Regis College in Weston, Mass. to get your graduate degree. Choose from any one of these courses. Master's of Science in Applied Behavior Analysis. Master's of Science in Special Education. Dual degree in Special Ed and ABA. Or be eligible for your post-master's certificate. You can complete your degree and be ready to sit for the exam in two years. And our 2017 grads had a 100% pass rate on the BACB exam. Come enjoy practicum placement support, ethics mini handbooks, PhD level professors, small class sizes, and a service trip to Iceland. If interested, don't delay. Supplies are limited. Learn more at regiscollege.edu. Again, that's www.regiscollege.edu. RegisCollege.edu. One more time, www.regiscollege.edu. See you there. And we are back talking about incidental teaching. But before we get into some more recent research, I want to remind all you listeners out there, all our friends, with your clipboards, that ABA Inside Track is ACE-approved. By listening to our show, you're able to earn one learning credit. For this episode, specifically one learning credit. All you need to do is finish listening to the episode and then go to the link in your podcast player. There's a whole notes page or our website, abainsidetrack.com slash getceus, G-E-T hyphen C-E-U-S, to find a link or a post for this page. You're going to need two secret code words once you get there, though. So let me give you the first of those right now. It is POCKETS. P-O-C-K-E-T-S. POCKETS. If you're a bossy girl in the 90s, you better have a dress with POCKETS (laughs) to hold your clipboard. POCKETS. You said that so many times. I love it. (laughs) Polly. Hot POCKETS. All right. Hot POCKETS. That's enough. I totally had a Polly Pocket. 
Yeah. Polly Pocket was fine, but She's Mighty still- Max was where no, it's at. <laughs> Polly Pocket is still around. My favorite monster. Mighty Max is not still around. You can still buy Polly Pockets. Oh, I had Charmkins. Mm. Did you have Charmkins? No. Okay. We'll talk about it later. All right. Okay. So, let's move into the 2000s. That's me. In the year 2000. I, my, my article is interesting. <laughs> my article is real well, snooze. I know, no, my interesting my article is interesting because it it it's not necessarily directly related to incidental teaching, mm. but it's looking at the various ways that you might use teaching strategies in a general preschool setting. And one thing that we've talked about here is you know people love incidental teaching, you know, uh, administrators love using it. We recommend using it, but this article looks at okay, there are different ways to teach kids and there these kids don't don't have a diagnosis. Let's put that out there right now. But we've never asked the kids what they like. And so this is one of the main features of this article is that they're looking at the spectrum of ways that you can teach kids are like which one is most effective. And which one do the kids prefer? And do those align? I'm surprised they didn't ask this question in the 90s, which was the era of kids rule. <laughs> gross out stuff. Right? And and what's that was? Slime on your head. There was so much slime. All the kids were asking, I want slime. And Why do you want dare. the slime? I want the slime to dump on my sister. Yeah. So they said there's kind of a spectrum of, of teaching technologies. On one end is like discovery-led learning where... There's a lot of grunt work for the teachers, right? They're choosing things to, they're like baiting the environment in a way to have kids learn to, like, learn themselves what they find. So, this is like they said, more of like a Montessori style, like right? Children's museum. Yeah. Like so, experiential it's, learning. Yeah. They call it discovery led. Yes. And so, the teacher doesn't provide prompts, right? Doesn't lead in any way. So, it's child led. And only if the child does something correctly do they provide praise but they don't correct, prompt, add anything like that. Then in the middle, they say, okay, here's like embedded teaching, and embedded teaching is a derivative of incidental teaching, right? So they say this lies right in the middle of the spectrum because it's a little bit of both. You have, it's child-led in the way that the child initiates what you're going to be teaching, but then the teacher does pride does provide prompts and consequences. And then on the other end of the spectrum is uh, direct instruction, which we all know is very teacher-directed. We provide prompts. It's multiple trials sometimes, sometimes artificial reinforcement, right? And so they have this whole spectrum, and they're like, okay, it doesn't look like anyone's ever looked at this. Mm-hmm. And I love that. I love so, it too. And I... And, when I first read this, I'm like, how are they going to do this? <laughs> right? Because there's so many things that are different, right? Prompts are different. How you set up situations are different. But spoiler, they did an amazing job. So they also looked at preference. So then once they exposed the tri- the children to the three different types, <coughs> they did a concurrent change to determine preference. So when we're talking about decades, I feel like the late 2000s into the early 2000s was really Greg Hanley's concurrent chains uh, phase of research oh, for sure yeah definitely when, when i when you read the sentence we did a first we did a p- color preference assessment you're like mm-hmm. 2000s like, hanley's been here right <laughs> 2000s greg yeah. t- i'll write your biography and i'll have like the different sections you know <laughs> describing your phases of research they're all moving they're all moving in the ways. early 2000s. I love the traditional FA. Yeah. The like, later 2000s, I've grown disillusioned with the traditional FA. And then concurrent chains right in the middle. Yeah. But anyway, for this for this study, there were six white preschool-aged children. I love that they use demographic data because there's never demographic data in the 2000s. So this was great when I saw I that. Was and surprised. I was surprised. Like, Whoa! Mm-hmm. So I put it in there. There was in the 70s. I didn't mention it, but they, they did yeah. point out the demographic data of Tur- Turner House. I mean, yeah. all black children. Yeah. yeah. They got lost. So none of the children had any diagnosis, formal diagnosis, but they did note that the skill level varied considerably among the preschool children. So they had informed consent, but did not mention anything about assent. But I'm assuming because the participants went to this small room Mm -hmm. with the experimenters next to their classroom that they were assenting, but they don't specifically say that. So I said, 
It was conducted in a small room next to the classroom. The materials corresponded to colors and animals. So what they were trying to teach was the Spanish relations to the name of an animal and the color of an animal, right, in Spanish. So they had three sets of target materials, and they rotated across the sessions to keep engagement high. And because they're working with kids to make sure that kids don't choose one of the targets because they like like the giraffe, the purple giraffe. Right, I don't, for sure. That's so smart. And they also, for the, they call it strategy three, which is more like the distru- direct instruction, they had color and animal cards and a treasure chest <coughs> and gold tokens. Right, for correct responding. And then for each of the strategies, they had a large and small poster board that signaled the specific condition by color, obviously. So they taught them to vocally label colors and animals in Spanish. They collected data in 15-second intervals. They looked if it was child-led, and that means if the child grasped the item within 15 seconds. They also looked at how many teacher-initiated learning opportunities were present by frequency, and then in strategy two and three, they looked at both, right? Because that happened in both. Yeah. All right. So during the preference assessment for the color, they just removed the color card from the door and handed it to the experimenter. They had high IOA, high IOA with some lower ranges. I wonder what happens, like 50, 60% mm. in some of those. But maybe you just couldn't see, right? Right. PI was collected on prompts and consequences. So in strategy one, they were looking for the non-occurrence of those. Right, because the teacher wasn't supposed to be doing anything. Right. And strategy two and three, they were looking for the occurrence of those. And high fidelity here suggests that the pre- procedures were run correctly, which is important, right? Because we're saying, yes. we're looking at these three strategies. We want to make sure that people did them correctly. So they use a multi-element design, although the graphs were not graphed in a multi-element design. Really, they were graphed in a cumulative mm-hmm. format. But that's okay. But one thing I did love that they mentioned is that they used the multi-element design because the rapid encounter balanced conditioned allowed outside factors to influence each condition similarly, like sickness, not sleeping, hungry, right? So yeah. I love that. Because they're good points. Yeah. Way to control for those outside variables. Yeah. And they are doing each of the teaching sessions one per day. Mm-hmm. Right. And it'll depend on which one goes first, depending on what conditions happening. So they did three preferences, uh, pre pre assessments, the color one, which I said, they're making sure that no color was the favorite. They used a it's pretty hard to do it for preschoolers. Yeah. And animals too. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So they wanted to make sure that the colors were all similarly preferred and not picked more or another. They did an echoic prom to make sure that students could do a one to five word echoic. And then they answered, they asked them all of the animals and colors in Spanish to make sure that they didn't already know them. And surprise, they did not. Okay. Then they did the efficacy assessment. So each condition was experienced one per day. The same con- teacher conducted each session and provided some sort of attention during the 15 second interval for strategy one and two to ensure attention was constant across all conditions. And strategy one and two. The time was yoked to strategy three because strategy three was longer. So they just wanted to make sure that everything was the same. I love when things people yoke things. I do love I, I do love yoking of conditions. This is a very well constructed right? study. It's beautiful. Just how you know both it was Greg Hanley and it was someone's dissertation. Nicole Hill's right. dissertation. Right. Yeah. Okay, so strategy one was that discovery, right? And before the session, because teachers couldn't really interact, they described their relations, right? They were like, giraffe. No, they use whatever giraffe is. Penguina. I don't know Spanish. I don't know what giraffe is in Spanish. Me neither. Mm -hmm. But then they arranged the environment. So that meant that they were sitting across from the kids. They were on a specific colored mat. All the toys and stuff were out. And the teacher gave praise when it was correct. But then that's about it. That's all they did. No prompts or question was provided. In strategy two, that's the embedded instruction. It looked exactly the same as strategy one, except when a child went to reach for a toy then they provided the vocal prompt when the child initiated what is it gato right mm-hmm. and then provided a model prompt following an error and they had a different color mat and there was no pre-exposure condition and then strategy three was direct instruction plus strategy two so they did direct instruction first with the cards and a progressive prompt delay so they did four to eight trials depending on responding once the student received eight gold tickets 
or tokens they exchanged for the treasure box. And then they implemented strategy two for four minutes. Mm. Right. So there was a lot of opportunities there. Yeah. Sessions were alternated between forced choice where the teacher had the choice, say, hand me the strategy one card and free choice. So that's where you're looking at that free choice is looking at that preference assessment. Mm -hmm. Sessions were continued until mastery criteria, which was 100% for two non-consecutive sessions or 80% for three non-consecutive sessions or until 90 sessions was were met. 90 sessions is so long. <laughs> mm -hmm. Or until you were too exhausted to continue. Right? <laughs> and then they did pre-test and post-test, right? The post-test was that pre-assessment. And the post-test was 80, 48 trials of animal and color cards saying, what color is it? What animal is this? To see how they did. Right? So they looked at cumulative opportunities. 48 different colors? No, they had... No, no, 48 trials. <laughs> There's no 40 colors. 48 Just trials. animals and colors. Okay. Just animals and I'm colors. So sorry. You really threw me for a loop there. I probably said that. Man, what's burnt sienna in <laughs> Spanish? It's getting hard. Right? What's asparagus? In <laughs> I just found out asparagus is a color. That's why I brought that up. Oh, well, I guess. Your child told me that. <laughs> so I feel do you trust smarter. Him? I do. Okay. Yep. Remember, I'm his favorite. So, <laughs> all right. So they looked at cumulative opportunities, correct responses, and preference. So one participant did best in that strategy three, but didn't meet master criteria for any of the blocks. One participant did best and had more opportunities in strategies three. And did better in strategy three, but then when you looked at strategy two, did better than animals and colors. They went real in. Mm -hmm. So participant three did better and had a more opportunities in strategy three. So that's generally the gist. Yeah. Strategy three, when you have some teacher directed and some student led, you see more opportunities, more mastery criteria, and you see more correct responding. So there was a low mean of correct responding in strategy one, which is that discovery learning. It mm -hmm. was points three but higher in strategy three, which is 6.8. But they do make the note that kids did learn in that strategy one where it's discovery-led learning. So that's important to note mm -hmm. that you don't always have to have teacher-directed learning. So that's it's beneficial. not without merit, right? but yeah. not necessarily most efficient. Right. So the pre-post-test scores were highest across strategy three, and seven out of 12 name relations were only met in strategy three. So we see that strategy three was the most effective. Now, what was most preferred? Strategy one was preferred for one of the clients. And then most of the other ones preferred strategy three. Hilariously, nobody really preferred strategy two. And the authors posit that it's possible that strategy two was fairly aversive because the kid would go for something and then the teacher yeah. would interject, right? Yeah. Possibly serving as a timeout for that preferred item. So that, that I think is one of the bigger... I don't know if limitations quite right because I think it's a limitation in terms of what we want to talk about today rather than what the goal of the research article was. But when we see the definition for embedded teaching and it's an extension of incidental teaching, you know, I read the definition as, oh, it's like they took incidental teaching and they made it horrible. You know, what <laughs> child wants, you know what children love? Being bothered with information that they're forced to recite. They love that. Well, yeah, and they also didn't contrive the motivation, right? Which right. is what we say yes. about incidental teaching exactly. is that the kids, the, the the toys are just there, right? They're not like they're not like, man, I really want to play with that blue pen. Kind of looking at today, it, like, right? oh, yeah, rojo. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, just reaching for something doesn't mean you actually want it, yeah. right? So and it, it could, but mm -hmm. and it also was was within their grasp. So everything was right in front of them. You know, I, I almost yeah. feel like this is the the, the the what what embedded teaching looks like is sort of what I would expect to see from someone who was never actually trained in incidental teaching, but sort of like read a pamphlet about it once and thought it sounded fun. And they're like trying their best, you know, they're chasing children down and making them say things like the kid. Clearly there's no motivation here. That child has moved on from the item that you had in your hand two minutes ago. So I, I, I would, I would not read this article as sort of an indictment of an incidental teaching is the crummiest and nobody likes it. Right. Because I don't think yeah. Yeah. this procedure really captures some of the key components that we talked about in incidental teaching. And, and, and I don't think it was it was exactly trying to. No, I don't it's, think so either. It's, yeah. It was a completely different I think it's idea. a really interesting question. Oh, it's mm -hmm. a great that question. They're asking oh, yes. here, and that's really important. And, and what you're describing, Rob, is a great point to bring up because sometimes you do see incidental teaching being conducted that way where it's, it's not... What's supposed to be is you're contriving a situation where the adult basically needs to help 
produce access to the thing, right? Not just stand as a barrier in the way to accessing mm-hmm. the mm-hmm. thing. And when just you make that small tweak, it does become a much more aversive situation. Yeah. And that's not the idea that you mm. want to have. No. Yeah. But anyway, so that's so, a great point. Yeah, I do. I, I, overall, that's really what happened. Mm-hmm. There's nothing left to talk about for my study, but I would really love to see a future study do this and use actual incidental teaching, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Contriving the motivating operation and see how that might change right. the perspective of everyone. And then ask the teachers too, out of the three, what do they prefer? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. And you may see a difference as well uh, with this type of study on how readily the students can learn in these varied environments. Right. Mm-hmm. Because, the, you know, part of incidental teaching is that you're practicing it in the natural setting so that you don't then need to make a big leap of generalization later. But if you have a student who's like, just teach me the things, right? Like, I know you're trying to teach me stuff. Like, let's just learn these Spanish words and then I'm good to go. Mm-hmm. That's going to be much more efficient for them as to just sit down, like, let's practice it a few times to get some gold coins and then I can move on and play. Mm-hmm. Versus if you really do need to practice it in the generalization setting in mm-hmm. order for that skill to be acquired and maintained in that setting, yeah. I think that may also be an important component here. Yeah, you, you've got to have a treatment that's both efficacious, efficient, and preferred. Ideally, you get all three. Yeah, You might not, but ideally you get all three. All right, well... While that was probably the most thorough, I think, of our so thorough of our studies, let's move into the final decade, the 2010s, with the 2011 his Say It All article. And I'm going to do this one very briefly because it doesn't add a lot in terms of incidental teaching literature, but it does bring us back to the original sort of conundrum that Hart and Risley found themselves in, which is, it's great that we have all these fabulous ways to teach language, But if it can't be done early enough in a child's life, and if it can't be done in the home setting, it really doesn't lead to the long-term benefits that the original, the the war on poverty, as, as it was called, was looking for. So this study was looking at, hey, what if we include parent and caregiver training in our incidental teaching procedure? If you've listened to any of our articles talking about behavior skills training, you kind of know where this one's going to go. But I'll walk you through it just in case it's your first episode ever. Sure. So we've got three caregivers. We've got a respite care provider. We've got a father. We've got a mother. So hitting all the caregiver categories (laughs) who have no experience in ABA. And then we have no grandparents. And then we have three children, eight and 10 years old, with autism and limited communication skills. They were all non-vocal. Two of them had MR at the time, and one had a genetic disorder, Phelan McDermott syndrome. And the goal was, can we teach parents and caregivers to use incidental teaching as a way to teach some, you know, simple mans for the individuals. They were teaching either handing over cards or making signs. So again, non-vocal participants, which we had not talked about in any of the other research. They were really just looking at both did the student or did the children or participants learn how to use these signs and to use their uh, card for communication, and how well did the caregivers actually implement incidental teaching? So in this, they kind of broke down incidental teaching into five steps, and then they sort of set up opportunities for training as well as for rehearsal and feedback. So the steps were, was the environment arranged properly? Did the adult get the child's attention, which actually seemed more like, did you make sure that the child was paying attention to you, adult? So it was a little, I think it was flipped a little bit. Was there an SD provided, which again, we talked about, maybe you don't always want to have one, but they did in this study. And then wait for five seconds for the child to make an initial response. If the child did make that response, hooray, you can, you know, give them what they asked for. It was, you know, getting their shoes on to go play outside or juice or chips with all sorts of different things. If not, use a prompt sequence to sort of give them a verbal prompt after five seconds, then model the target response after five seconds, then manually guide them to engage in the response, and then give them the item similar to how Hart and Risley had done it. The SDs all really were related to what the child was interested in. Like I said, it was playing, signing sand to go to the sandbox, signing shoes to get your shoes on so you can go play outside, which I don't know how they had to... No, it's just a sign for shoes. Oh, okay. For some reason, I thought that's what you were asking me. No, you just made a sign. I I don't quite know how they got multiple trials of let's put your shoes on and go outside without bringing the child back inside and taking their shoes off again, but they don't describe some of that, so we'll use our imagination here. They played for a little bit and then came in. They came in. 
you, we have a concurrent multiple baseline study here. Pretty straightforward. We have our baseline where they just said, here's what incidental teaching is, caregivers. Try your best to teach these responses. In this case, it was signing sand and signing shoes and then exchange, doing a picture exchange for shoes and outside again. And as you'd expect, you know, the, the, the caregivers all tried their best and they did okay, actually. Their results were not terrible, but they certainly were not engaging in a full incidental teaching uh, procedure. Then they went into the training phrase. And you might say, was it called the behavior skills training phrase? And I would say, no, it was called the review plus model plus feedback phrase. Do you mean phase? Phase, yes. Well, I'll that's say it because again. they already gave them the instructions. So behavior skills training is instructions, modeling, role play, feedback. But yes. you said in baseline, they were given instructions. They were given a definition of incidental teaching. Mm. I don't know how thorough it was. And I understand the distinction, Diana. However, to call something the review plus model plus feedback phase when you probably could have just called it the like meaningful BST phase instead probably would have saved some saved some. Uh, Where's your viewer two when you need them? It was it was it was just a little felt a it felt a little much. But in any case, so here's where they got the list describing how yeah. So there you go. It was actually. <laughs> Skills running. They got a list of steps how to do incidental teaching. They were given graphic and verbal feedback on their baseline performances. So again, not something that's always included in behavior skills training. They were told how many steps were correct, which steps they needed to improve. They were shown a model of incidental teaching for one trial. And then they were told, okay, do it yourself. And they'd help them set up three trials within their training session of the parent or caregiver with the child. And then after that rehearsal, they'd get verbal feedback, what they did right, and emphasis on specific steps that had been implemented correctly. That was a quote in there and they'd continue until everyone was performing at 90 percent correct responding of the incidental teaching steps for nine total trials then they did a feedback only phase where they took out all the other reteaching and they just gave feedback for the incidental teaching performance of the caregiver then they did a post-training session where they said all right do incidental teaching as best you can this was a couple weeks after the case and used uh, some novel tasks so getting chips getting grapes or using a picture card to get a cup of soda gross were the responses so as i kind of already mentioned they didn't do that much right during baseline you know so they tried their best during training, as you would expect to see in a study using BST, there was an increase in how much the caregivers used incidental teaching or, or carried out incidental teaching procedures correctly. And the interesting thing, though, in terms of child responding, it was a little inconsistent. You know, we had one child that, yes, with my caregiver giving incidental teaching, I got, got mastery in my response. Two, that showed an increase from baseline, but, you know, still kind of seemed like closer to 50%, so not really the kind of responding we're looking for. However, when we looked at post-training, one of them went up to 100%, so perhaps it was a matter of they just weren't giving the parents and caregivers enough time to implement incidental teaching in these small sessions. With novel tasks, we had one participant who immediately was able to learn the expectation very quickly, one that was close to 70%, and again, one that was above baseline, but not, you know, a little below 50%. So what you can take from this is that it really wasn't that hard to teach caregivers to use incidental teaching, and it did result in increases in language use, at least in these very specific responses, for our three participants. Two sort of varying kind of mastery levels, I would say, or, from, or lack of mastery levels. And the nice thing was the amount of time, the, the review plus feedback, plus model phase only took 28 minutes per person. It was a total time for instruction, whereas the feedback was only taking about four minutes. So they were much faster. I'm assuming they just... So they already the received the other type of training. Yes, yeah, so the feedback, the feedback only should not so have taken that's not really long. fair. No, but it's important to know that some of the follow-up and then for the generalization probes, they didn't need any additional training. So while there was maybe a decent amount of time to start, it doesn't require ongoing training to teach, to generalize to teaching other skills. The big question here was, do the kids really like some of these activities? Would their results have been better if they'd, say, done a preference assessment rather than just parent report, perhaps? And then, again, the prompting procedure, they were wondering whether maybe the Hart and Risley prompt might have taught a waiting response. Because, again, if you don't engage in any of the language targets, you eventually do still get the item. You know, the valid question, I think other researchers pointed to. That's not really an important component. Though, again, it could happen for certain learners. So. Great. Incidental teaching, we brought it all the way back from the Turner House all the way <laughs> to your very own home. And that brings us to the end of our episode, meaning we're going to enter Dissemination Station. <laughs> all right, so 
let's do a couple things. I think this is a good one to do a very quick summary because we went over a lot of articles. I think we should give a nice, succinct definition of incidental teaching and then talk about some areas that we think incidental teaching can be most effectively used. So Diana, you are our definition maven. What would you say if folks needed uh, the quick the quick and dirty incidental teaching definition, what would you say? I still like the definition I gave at the beginning, which is you are creating an opportunity in the natural environment by, you know, manipulating access to certain items. You're contriving those opportunities. Could be something's out of reach. Could be that you need help opening a thing, right? It could be that something's not working properly and you need to ask for help. Any of those situations is the main feature. And then the you're going to look for indication that that MO is present. You're then going to prompt the current level of response that is usually a manned in order to then produce access to whatever the naturally occurring reinforcer is in the environment. That's good. And Jackie, where would you say, at least looking at research, looking at your own your own practice, where have you seen incidental teaching sort of most most effective or where do you recommend other practitioners really think about implementing incidental teaching? Make sure that your child can learn through incidental teaching first. So make sure you're doing that assessment first to figure out, you know, if that's something that's going to be helpful for them. And then I think future research will really look at that preference to see what kids prefer. And then if everything is effective, right, if direct instruction is effective, this mix of the two is effective, just innocential teaching is effective, then I think running preference assessments, I think would be best. So you're capitalizing on what the client wants. Okay. But given client interest, given ability to learn, do are, there, it. are there just across the day or the settings yeah. you tend to find? Do it. People like to use it, don't like to use I it. I think people should always use it if it is effective, right? Because it capitalizes on the motivation of the child and what's actually happening in the real world, right? So I think that's ultimately what we want, right? We want kids to be interacting with the real world in a way that is great for them and helps them establish relationships and get what they want. Right. That's all what we want. That's what we want in our life. Mm-hmm. We want to establish relations and get what we want. And <laughs> right. That's what I want anyway. Right. That's at least and, where you start. And, you want to start there. Yeah. You know, I've had I have had families say, well, why are we creating all of these opportunities? Right. And you should still think of incidental teaching as teaching. Right. Yes, this absolutely. Is the teaching part so that when it's suddenly a non teaching environment and these things happen where something's out of reach or you're out of milk or you can't find the scissors or this thing is stuck and doesn't work anymore. The batteries are dead, right? All of those situations that do occur naturally, you have practiced previously what to do in those situations and your child knows how to respond and how to get your attention and ask for the things that they need. Mm-hmm. That's the real life, right? So even though yeah. incidental teaching is occurring in the natural setting, it's still teaching it's still a teaching time and opportunity so that's a good distinction to make i like that yeah i think that's it great all right i hope everyone out there enjoyed our trip down memory lane regarding incidental teaching research and if you have not been using incidental teaching or thinking of some times that you may use it or some other questions you want to ask about incidental teaching for your from your own practice and for those of you who use it all the time i hope that you enjoyed some of the historical documentation that we were able to go through on this episode and With that, I want to say a fond adieu to all of you out there. Thank you so much for listening to ABA Inside Track. I can't see you, so I don't know if your motivation is to turn off your podcast (laughs) player, but I'll assume at this point it is. We want to say, please, we hope you enjoyed the show. And if you did, subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, wherever you like to get your podcasts. There are a couple other places you can find us on the interwebs. You can find us on the social medias at ABA Inside Track. You can go to our YouTube page if you'd like to see these episodes with the YouTube subtitling feature. You can go to our website, abainsidetrack.com, to find links to all of the articles discussed on this episode, as well as our previous episodes, and a place to purchase CEs. And speaking of CEs, if you would like a CE for listening to this episode, you're going to want that second secret code word. It is LUAU. L-U-A-U. It's a party? I don't know. I don't actually know like the definition of luau. I kind of just think of it as the one that we'd go to at like the Polynesian Resort at Disney World, which wow. may or may not be the most culturally appropriate <laughs> use of luau. Right. But it was the 90s. We didn't know any you better. Know. Yeah. Anyway. It's Hawaiian... 
It's a Hawaiian word. Luau. And if you would like to hear longer discussions about topics, why not head over to patreon.com slash ABA Inside Track, where you can subscribe to get early access to our episodes as well as discounts at our CE store for only $5 a month. And if you would like to hear discussions about books like Meaningful Differences, as well as to get two free CEs, you can subscribe at our premium $10 level. Our last book club was not Meaningful Differences, but instead of The Nurture Effect, where we talked about preventative care. And again, that's patreon.com slash ABA Inside Track. And finally, if you want to reach out with ideas or just to get in touch with us, ABA Inside Track at gmail.com always works. Before we sign off, I also want to say thank you to Dr. Jim Carr for recording our intro and outro music, Kyle Sturry for our interstitial music, and Dan Thabit of the Podcast Doctors for his fabulous editing work. We'll be back next week with another episode. But until then, keep responding. Bye. Bye. Bye.